This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. This hour, 4th District Congressman Jin Himes joins us for an in-depth conversation on what's happening in the nation and how that impacts Connecticut. He's been serving in Congress since 2009 and a ranking member, a ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, and he also serves on the Financial Services Committee. What are your questions for Congressman Himes? We want to give you a chance to ask one of our state's top lawmakers your questions. Call in at 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Congressman Himes, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Catherine. So I want to jump straight into the hot topic over the last couple of days, especially over the weekend, is the U.S. debt default. Uh, Just this weekend, the White House and the GOP House Speaker Kevin McCarthy reached a tentative agreement to raise a debt limit. And speaking about that deal this weekend, you said it does not include any Democratic priorities. Can you tell us about about the proposal and what are what were some of your thoughts going through your mind when this um, when this agreement was going through? Yeah, so um, it, uh, two two important things to say about this deal, and we'll be voting on it tomorrow, apparently, uh, Wednesday. Um, number one is, um, of course, it doesn't contain Democratic priorities, because what it is, it's a ransom list. It's a ransom list of things that the Republican majority in the House of Representatives wanted to even consider an extension of the debt ceiling. So this idea that it was a negotiation, uh, it was a negotiation only in as much as a the president succeeded in taking down a House wish list that was devastating, absolutely devastating, would have reversed all of the good work that the Congress did in the last session on climate change, would have put in draconian work requirements on elderly people, on Medicaid. Uh, the good news is the president and uh, the Democrats negotiated it down to a measly little package that will make nobody happy, but really doesn't have much impact. Uh, and there are people on both sides of the aisle screaming from the roofs right now. But the reality is that this package is really measly. Um, and so I'll be able to support it. I'm not happy about it. But the alternative, of course, you know, torpedoing the global economy with the first ever U.S. default is so awful that I'm not contemplating. it. The other thing, of course, that we really should be talking about is how regularly do we want to do this? How regularly do we want the debt ceiling to effectuate uh, whichever party is in the minority? And, and, and to date, of course, the Democrats have not done this. But, you know, we learn, we learn. And I tell my Republican friends, the next time there's a Republican president, we won't do what we did under Donald Trump, which is the responsible thing. We'll have our list of ransom demands. And is that really the way we want to govern this country? Do what I want or we blow up the economy. It's That's, that's madness, Catherine. Well, and then what you just said, it sounds very, very dramatic, right? And and but you also mentioned that there ha- there is not a lot of impact with this. I'm going to ask a very so it's of, kind of a dumb question, but also a question of why should people care? Um, as you mentioned, do you, do we want to have this conversation over and over again? And we've had this conversation before, so I think it's implicitly just asking, you know, why should people care that this is happening? Well, <clears throat> you know, as as good citizens, we care about changes in policy. But I mean, I called this measly for a reason. Um, I mean, let's take what is most painful perhaps for Democrats, which is um, the um, expansion of work requirements for uh, food stamps, Uh, the age uh, at which you will still have to either be employed or seeking employment goes from 49 to 54. At the same time, veterans and the homeless, the most vulnerable people, um, thanks to the good negotiators uh, in the White House, uh, will not be subject to those work requirements. So in the end, you know, it's probably going to be a net change of, you know, tens of thousands of Americans either way. And that's that's serious, but it's not relative to a country with 330 million people in it. It's not dramatic. It's pretty measly in its in its impact. Uh, and, and much of the provisions of this bill are, are that way. The reason people should care is because if the bill is not passed on Wednesday, Um, there will be chaos in the markets. Um, You know, the notion that the United States would not service its debt, not pay out Social Security checks, not pay soldiers and Marines and sailors um, is unthinkable. And the chaos that that would unleash in the the markets and then in the real economy, right? You know, uh, people would start losing their jobs. It's really a one-way bet. And I mean, if we'd achieved spectacular things as part of this deal, um, you know, I might have a different view. But again, it's a measly ugly little package for which we risked 
American economic stability, and by the way, for, for which we embarrassed ourselves abroad. The president was supposed to be in East Asia two weeks ago or a week ago to show our commitment to a region that is very risky. And he had to cancel that for a purely manufactured crisis. So again, I won't continue my sermon here, but to say that I hope we can go back to achieving our legislative aims, not because we unpin a grenade and put it on the table and say, if you don't do what I want, it will blow up, but because we actually do the old school thing of passing stuff in the House and the Senate and getting the president to sign it. Well, and speaking of the old school thing, you mentioned that the bill would go to the House uh, Wednesday evening, tomorrow evening. So what do you expect from that? Well, right now, um, I would expect it to pass the House. Um, It will certainly lose um, far right votes. The Freedom Caucus is up in arms about it because they have these, you know, uh, you know, fantastical objectives that they think that even though they don't have the Senate and the presidency, they should be able to reshape American society in their image. So they'll vote against it. Um, and then on my side of the aisle, there will absolutely be progressive votes against it, um, n- not not because it's a hideous deal, but because it moves the country in the wrong direction. We're trying to get to a place, particularly coming out of COVID, where more people have the support that they need, healthcare, care, uh, education, um, nutrition assistance that allows them to take advantage of a record hot job market. So um, long story short, I do think it'll pass the House. The Senate is a more problematic thing because, of course, any one senator can 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 slow things down for 24 or 48 hours. And it's not clear that we have that time for this to be slowed down. Well, we have time now for a quick question from Peter in Wallingford, who has a question for you, Congressman, about the debt limit. Peter, you're on the air. Hi, Jim Himes. I am very curious what your answer is about either stupidity or being naive that the Democrats, I heard on NPR News just recently, that we could have avoided a default on the Democratic side if we had voted on raising the debt limit before last December, last year, I think it was. Yeah, that's correct, Peter. Um, um, Theoretically, we could have, um, when we had uh, prior to January uh, of this year, when we had the majority in the House and the Senate, And the presidency, we might have moved this debt ceiling. By the way, for all the reasons I've explained this morning, we should have moved it, you know, 30 years down the road, 40 years down the road. Um, Whether there were the votes for that, of course. Now, remember, um, in theory, we could have passed it. But in the Senate, um, two names regularly come up as opposing these sorts of things. That's uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. So uh, and, and, and remember, again, in the Senate with the filibuster, we would have needed some Republican votes. So in theory, yes, we could have dispensed with this. But whether the votes would have been there to do so uh, is, a, is a very different question. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for your call and question and reminding our listeners that you can also join the conversation. Give us a call, 888-720-9677, or leave us a message on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So sort of following along the same uh, topic, Congressman, student loan debt, uh, that's something that would be impacted um, by what has been happening with the debt ceiling. So can you talk about, you know, what would this mean for college graduates and for those who have applied and have been accepted because it could be stopped? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in keeping with my take that this deal is sort of measly and unpleasant, um, it doesn't do much in the student loan arena. It basically prevents the president from extending the forbearance period that uh, student loan holders have had during the COVID era. Um, But it only prevents that, of course, assuming that he doesn't declare another national emergency because there's another pandemic. So again, uh, in keeping with my theme here, it's a measly, awful little deal, um, but but will is where is better than the alternative. The pro the the, Catherine, though, you you ask a really important question, you know, with well in excess of one point six trillion dollars in student debt out there. Um, it's beginning to have a real effect on people's lives and 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 the economy as a whole. You know, a, a middle class family that's burdened with a huge amount of student debt um, isn't buying a home. They're not eating in restaurants. They're putting off purchasing a car in an economy that is driven by consumer um, purchases. Um, and to make a very long story short, we've gotten ourselves in a position where to to move ahead to be to, you know to be middle class in this country, you need higher education of some kind or another, not necessarily college, but some kind of uh, higher education. And it's become so expensive that everybody needs to not everybody, but almost everybody needs to borrow to do it, and that's having a really difficult effect on the economy. So to make a long story short, I think the president and his idea were was was pointing in the right direction, which is let's take. The people who are most burdened by a lot of student debt, those folks who are making 
not a lot of money. Um, and let's provide them with some relief. Not everybody. I mean, you know, the truth is there's lots of people out there, doctors and lawyers who are carrying student debt who are perfectly capable of servicing it. But um, those people who are really staggering under a huge load of student debt, they, they, we would all benefit if they got some relief. Well, I think you just listed out a, a grocery list of why this would be a priority. But can you also talk about, do you have any ideas of sort of long-term solutions for student loan debt? Or like you mentioned, maybe college is not for everybody. A lot of students are looking for alternatives like community colleges. But as we all know, they're historically underfunded. So curious as your thoughts in terms of um, making this a priority and are there proposals or ideas for more viable opportunities for students who are looking for maybe a different option compared to your traditional four-year college? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great and critical question. And, um, you know, it doesn't have one silver bullet answer. Um, you know, the reality is that the true pain, the real pain, the, the tragedies around student loan debt are not the lawyer who's carrying, you know, $100,000 in, in, in debt. That's a pain in the neck for that lawyer. The real tragedies are people who get degrees that are not commercially valuable. Uh, oftentimes, it'll be for-profit colleges offering degrees in, uh, you know, uh, hospitality, where the pay is very, very low. And so now you have an individual who maybe doesn't even finish that degree because the economics of getting it are so challenging. Um, carries a whole lot of debt and is looking at jobs that pay minimum wage. That's that's where there's a lot of tragedy and where I think we should target relief. Um, that's not to say that there aren't, you know, uh, starting teachers who are starting out with very low salaries and huge amounts of student debt. There, are, you know, there absolutely is a population. So, so, so the it's a frustrating issue because, of course, the federal government um, doesn't control what um, for profit or what private universities charge for tuition. We obviously have some say over state colleges and state universities. But but what excites me here, Catherine, apart from, you know, maybe regulating those colleges, those for profit colleges that are fraudulent in their offerings, um, pushing other universities to offer better value. When we talk about the higher education sector, it's one of the great um, uninnovated, uh, undisrupted segments in our society. You know, we, we, we still say too much, way too much that. You know, you need to go to a four-year university and get this BA or this BS. You know, why, why four years? Why not three years? What's magic about four years? Um, by the way, what about a summer off? That's a relic of an agricultural age. What, what if you have a, somebody who's working and they could do it in two years without summers off? And so um, some of the innovative um, changes that one sees happening out there may, may help with this. Um, and by the way, the market is speaking. You know, if you look at young people, a lot of them are saying, wait a minute, you know, four years at $70,000 a year compared to what I'm going to actually get for that. Um, and they're, they're opting out of it. So um, I do think that it's a sector that is really ripe for, for innovation and for disruption to make it more economically feasible for people to get the education they absolutely need. Right. And I mean, even even the time since I've been in college and high school versus today, I feel like the mindset of, of choosing and having uh, different options have changed uh, over the last decade or so. And speaking on that note, keeping on our theme, we have a question from Jeff, who is in Stanford. Jeff, you are on the line. Hello. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I think you just touched on it. So I appreciate that. Just wondering, uh, you know, rather than reducing the student led student debt, which is obviously uh, one component. H how do we reduce the cost of actually colleges, for instance? H how do we reduce the cost uh, when I hear studies that the cost went up exponentially, but the output isn't really exponential? It it's it's uh, what, what do we do in that area? Well, yeah, so yeah. Much. Great, great question, Jeff. And we did touch on this. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is not just policy for me. It's personal. I'm, I'm in the middle of educating two, uh, two smart girls <laughs> and writing, writing checks that just blow my mind uh, to pay for private educations for them in private universities. Um, and, and, you know, it is a really hard problem because, of course, um, other than state universities, uh, over which our state legislatures have some control, um, you know, no government gets to tell uh, you know, Yale or Trinity or University of Bridgeport, what they can charge. And if you think about the sh incentive structures that those universities have, um, because an education is so critical and because an elite education in particular um, is so valuable to people's social networks and that sort of thing, 
um, they can charge what they want. And they know that they'll end up in a situation where they are today, where, you know, more than nine out of 10 people at an elite university are on some form of financial aid. I mean, think about that, you know, only, you know, in excess of nine out of 10 people can purchase your product only if they borrow or have financial aid. I mean, on the face of it, that's a little, a little nutty. Um, but, um, you know, I, I do think that government and our communities more broadly need to push these universities to to innovate. I mean, so here we are, we're communicating over an online um, uh, uh, mechanic right now. Um, you know, why do I need to show up at a red brick building covered in ivy to get the education that I might be able to get delivered, you know, to my home if I live in rural Nebraska? So I'm just giving examples here of innovations that have largely been stymied in the higher education sector, which, you know, could at the end of the day provide much, much better value for money uh, for the same or better educations. And thank you so much for that question, Jeff. And Congressman, we've been talking a lot about finances and I want to also talk about your work on the House Intelligence Committee in which you were named the top Democrat on the committee in February and you've been um, involved in this for for about a decade. And you met, you've you also met with uh, President um, Volodymyr Zelensky back in October. Just want to ask, you know, what was that meeting like and what were the priorities of that particular visit? Yeah, so we went to Ukraine in October of last year. When I say we, it was um, um, uh, my counterpart, the Republican uh, chairman of the committee, and I, the, the the lead Democrat on the committee, Mike Mike Turner, being the Republican chairman. And we wanted to send a signal um, that the bipartisan that there is very strong bipartisan support for uh, the Ukrainian fight for their self-determination. Um, and so we went and yes, we had that meeting. I'll tell you to answer your question. It was remarkable. Uh, I am way too young to remember what it was like in London during world war II, but I've read the history books, uh, here, the, 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 the city and the country is being absolutely pummeled by the Nazis. Um, and the, uh, rallied by Winston Churchill, the English, the British are, uh, getting ever more determined. You remember that incredible speech about we will fight them on the beaches, et cetera. Um, that's what it felt like to be in Kiev. You know, these poor people, uh, missiles regularly landing in the downtown of their capital city, and yet they're going about their business. They're going to work. And to a person, they were saying, we will see this through to the end to when we kick the Russians off our land. And I tell you, it, it sort of chokes you up to think about it because, uh, uh, you know, you think we have problems. Um, here's a country that is uh, that has absorbed just staggering violence, staggering death and destruction. And yet their morale and their uh, dedication to their cause is, is, uh, is as strong as ever. Well, I was going to say stories and, um, you know, news like this certainly puts our own lives in perspective. And and Governor uh, Ledamon and other Connecticut leaders have called for unity with Ukraine to mark the one year anniversary in February. So I want to ask to Congressman, you know, how are you representing the needs of Ukrainians living in Connecticut? Or are you hearing are you hearing things that they need and that the government the government needs to do better or do more on? Well, um, so a couple things to say about that. Number one, um, I do have to explain sometimes to people what our interest is in this fight. You know, we're, we're sending billions of dollars of, of hard-earned taxpayer money over there. And people legitimately ask the question, now, wait a minute, you know, we've got an affordable housing crisis right here in southwestern Connecticut. Our schools could use investment. And so the case has to be made. And I think the case is a strong one. Um, there's a values case, which is that we did, none of us want to live in a world where you know, the strong do whatever they want and the suffer, uh, the weak suffer what they uh, have to suffer. Um, you know, we've spent centuries getting away from that to a world order where people don't invade other countries just because they can. The other thing which is maybe more practical in that regard is that we learned in the 20th century that if you appease um, brutal dictators, eventually you're going to fight them. You know, you might not fight the Russians in Ukraine, but if you let them take Ukraine, expect to see them in Poland. And, um, you know, you just have to be very conscious of the fact that um, um, that the world has a way of intruding, as it did in the 20th century, any number of times into our peace and our stability. And so um, I certainly believe and most Americans believe, believe that we don't want to go back to some early 1900s thing where, you know, Putin rolls into countries that he feels like taking. Um, and uh, so as a result, I think most people support that. Um, I have been a critic, I must tell you. Um, I, I regard stalemate as sort of sort of a morally impossible place to be. I mean, hundreds of people on both sides dying every day. 
Um, you know, we watched all summer or all winter long as the Russians, you know, took inch by inch in this town that nobody had ever heard of, Bakhmut. And maybe they've taken it now, but at the cost of tens of thousands of lives. I've, I've been a critic of the president because I think I think we should send the Ukrainians what they need and what they want to end this stalemate and allow them to win this war so that they can go back um, to being the thriving Western oriented country that they want to be. So look, I think we just need to hold the line, um, help the Ukrainians as much as we can and make it very clear to the Russians that they are completely isolated with the exception of the Chinese, which aren't, who aren't helping them much. Um, they are isolated and you know, how long do you want to be isolated? Because that's just not a recipe for succeeding in the 21st century. And uh, also on the intelligent note, one, we only have a couple minutes left in this segment, but I do want to ask real quickly about the Chinese surveillance balloon that was happening earlier this year. Can you give us an idea of what happened with that? And you've also um, talked about how you were surprised by sort of the clumsiness of a country that literally just handed over technology for the U.S. to dissect. Um, at the same time, you were also critical against your colleagues from the other side of the aisle who wanted it to be shot down. So it's kind of a big question here, but wanted to ask what what are your takeaways from that incident? And do you have any updates on that? Yeah, yeah. You know, as like so many things, it looks a little smaller in the rear view mirror. But um, uh, here, here's what the, the what the Chinese are doing. Um, you know, they think about Taiwan. They think about their immediate sphere of influence. You know, balloons are very, very cheap compared to fighter jets and bombers and that sort of thing. So the Chinese are thinking, what if we could put, you know, 2000 of these things uh, over the South China Sea? You know, sure, you can shoot down half of them, but we've still got a thousand. So this is not that's what this is about. This is not about flying balloons over the continental United States. That's pretty stupid when you think about it. We, get, we, we see it, we shoot it down, we get to look at it up close and personal. Um, and I happen to believe based on, you know, all that I've learned that this was not deliberate, meaning it, you know, probably drifted, probably didn't receive very high level Chinese approval. Again, think of how stupid this is, right? Uh, especially since there's not much you can collect, right? Um, it didn't come up much at the time, but um, we have something called the Open Skies Treaty with Russia. Uh, and that means we get to fly our military planes. The Air Force flies over Russian nuclear sites and they fly over our nuclear sites in Montana and Colorado and Wyoming. And so we're pretty good at closing the doors and shutting the roofs and stopping the transmission of signals that we don't want them to um, uh, collect. So at the end of the day, I'm pretty convinced that the Chinese got pretty much nothing from their little sojourn over the continental United States. So now you're arguing about should it have been shot down over Montana over, or over the water off of South Carolina? Personally, I wouldn't want to be the North, the 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 uh, the uh, Montanan cowboy uh, who has you know ten tons of metal raining down on his ranch. So um, you know, I, at the end of the day, I think the president made the right decision, and uh, hopefully, the Chinese have learned that this is not a good way to advance relations with uh, with even an antagonistic country. Well, we need to take a short break on that note. Congressman Jim Himes is our guest today. He's here to answer your questions. So give us a call at 888-720-9677 or leave us a question on Facebook or Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Today, we're catching up with Congressman Jim Himes. He represents Connecticut's 4th District, and he's here to talk about issues that are important to him and to answer your questions. So let us know what questions you have for the congressman. Give us a call, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So speaking of an important topic, Congressman, I know the January 6, 2021 insurrection is a topic that's close to you. And it's been two years since that incident. And we know so much more now compared to the day of and the days after. So as more information comes down the pipe, what are your thoughts on this, Congressman, especially uh, as of now? You know, two people have been sentenced to prison terms. One of them received an 18 year sentence behind bars, which is the longest prison sentence so far in the hundreds of uh, capital riot cases. So just want to pick your brain on that, Congressman. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very personal for me. Um, I was one of the last members out of the chamber on January 6th, and it was a horrifying moment. I mean, not horrifying because I necessarily thought I was going to die, although there were moments where I wondered. Um, just horrifying because I just never imagined I would see Americans breaking windows and attacking police officers um, 
uh, in the service of trying to stop a constitutional democratic process. I just, if you told me I was going to see that five years ago, I would have said, you're out of your mind. We're a better country than that. Um, turns out we're not. Um, and yes, I'm very, very happy to see the accountability being visited on those who did that. Um, and it's been, you know, the Department of Justice has brought cases against something like a thousand people. It's been the largest investigation uh, in American history. But what really worries me is two things. Number one, um, the instinct is alive and well. Um, you know, Donald Trump, uh, I wouldn't recommend this, but, you know, just look at what he is saying, what he's putting up on Truth Social. It is blisteringly angry, apocalyptic language. Um, you know, the country is going down the tubes, the communists and, uh, you know, uh, uh, haters and traitors. And I mean, it's just brutal, apocalyptic language. And there is still, I don't know what it is, but a quarter or a third of the American population that just eats that up. And it, and it makes me really sad, frankly, because, well, sad and worried, right? Because, you know, for every million people that is uh, imbibing this apocalyptic rhetoric full of hatred and anger and rage, um, for every million people, there's going to be a few who are armed um, and who are going to be motivated to, 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 you know, go after somebody, maybe a member of Congress, maybe their governor. Um, and it's just profoundly irresponsible. It's rooted in lies. It's rooted in, you know, picking at uh, grievance and cultivating grievance in a way that just twists people's minds. And that's, that, that, that Catherine is, is, was the takeaway that I still struggle with is, the fact that when I left the chamber, and, and I've already said I am happy beyond belief that accountability is being visited on these people, but as I left the chamber and literally stepped over um, insurrectionists who were being held at gunpoint so that we could get out, I looked down and, you know, these weren't proud boys. I mean, of course, there were some proud boys there, some truly awful people, but these were regular Americans that you'd bump into in a Starbucks in southeastern Virginia or wherever. Um, and I'm, I just continue to be haunted by how Americans can be twisted and warped by an obvious con man, a just disgusting, morally repugnant con man who will allow that con man to take control of their psyches in a way that they will commit brutal crimes. That, 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 that continues to scare me. And I can point a lot of fingers at Donald Trump and at the MAGA um, extremists. But I also am very interested in what those of us who don't live in that camp can do. And I think that's to think hard, not just about accountability, but about the conditions that give rise to that kind of warped thinking. And with that sort of thought in mind, too, you know, we're, we're heading into the 2024 election. I mean, we're, we're obviously more than a year out, but it could it feels just like around the corner. And I want to ask you, too, you know, what who do you think will win the primaries? Do you have any people that you're supporting for the upcoming election? And what are some of the priorities that you feel should be at the forefront of the campaigning? Yeah, well, your, your question's an easy one. I mean, unless something dramatic happens, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee and Joe Biden will be the Democratic nominee. We could have a lengthy conversation about what might happen and uh, whether that's uh, you know probable in the long run. But I, I do think that's the most likely um, likely outcome here. Uh, and so, you know, we'll be treated to a rematch of what we saw in 2020. Speaking from my political perspective, and I think probably the majority of Americans' perspective, if the 2020 election is any indicator, hopefully the outcome will be uh, the same or better, um, that more of the MAGA extremism and the apocalyptic, brutal language of Donald Trump is rejected by a country that has sort of refound its decency. Um, but I don't see any reason to believe that it's not going to be a, uh, you know, sadly, another, another Trump-Biden uh, rematch. So I want to bring the conversation uh, back to a more uh, local angle is uh, talking about you know, your congressional district. The fourth district includes most of Fairfield County, which is a region that has a lot of uh, a pretty extreme income disparity. So I want to ask you, Congressman, you know, how do you ensure that you are representing all the voices in your region? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a, it's something I feel every day, right? I mean, I represent some of the wealthiest people in the world in communities like, you know, Darien and Greenwich and New Canaan. And then I represent some, tr some, some, some tremendously challenged communities in cities like Bridgeport, you know, where poverty is rampant, a mere 10 miles away from, uh, from unimaginable wealth. So I see this disparity probably more than uh, maybe more than any other member of Congress, um, a handful of exceptions, perhaps. But um, so, yeah, no, and I was so uh, blessed to be asked by Speaker Pelosi in the last Congress to chair the uh, the um, uh, Select Committee on Economic Disparity. And we could spend two hours on the topic, but um, I'll tell you, let me let me tell you two things that we need to do. 
Um, two things that we need to do to address economic disparity. There's, there's 20 things we need to do, but let me tell you the two that I can get into a 60 second soundbite. Number one, we need to build a lot more housing. Um, you know, you just can't have thriving economies in the country if people are paying, you know, half of their income or more to be housed in economically vibrant areas. And that, 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 by the way, applies to the homeless right up through the upper middle class where, where it's a huge economic drag on people. The other, which in some ways I feel even more passionately about um, is we do a terrible job in this country relative to our competitors, Britain, Japan, South Korea, Germany, investing in our youngest people, um, starting starting with, you know, uh, uh, child care for mothers. Um, you think about a mother um, in Bridgeport with two or three kids who desperately wants to work, but there's no affordable child care. And as a consequence, she's not working or he's not working. There could be uh, single parents of, of either gender. Um, and, um, you know, that, that child is in many instances not getting the kind of um, – early education they might get at a place like the child care learning centers in Stanford, Connecticut, which is just a superb organization. And so, you know, I hope um, that we get to a place where we say as a moral matter, we need to invest an awful lot more in the youngest Americans. And by the way, as a competitive matter, we need to do that. You know, what, what do you think the outcomes are going to be if South Korea and Great Britain and Germany and Japan are investing much more in the educations and, and health uh, and stability of their youngest citizens, and we're not. You can you can see where that race is going to go. And and on that too, uh, I want to. I'm very curious to ask you about the documentary series that, or not series, but a documentary that you were a part of. You know, you you, are, you led the House Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. And I guess as part of that process, uh, the committee released a documentary that explores Americans' financial challenges. So, can you tell us, you know, how did that came about, and what did you learn from that process? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll tell you, though I was chairing the Committee on Economic Disparity at the time, the documentary we produced, which is called Grit and Grace, one can look it up on YouTube, and I hope people will. Grit and Grace was actually a response to January 6th. And what I told you about what it felt like to look down at people being held at gunpoint amidst broken glass who were just normal Americans. And I realized in that moment that we just don't know each other anymore as Americans, right? We think of each other as stereotypes. You're a lefty Chardonnay sipping coastal elite. You're not a person. You're a MAGA fascist. You're not a person. And so this um, documentary was really designed to tell the story of three American families, uh, an immigrant in uh, California, um, uh, an African-American in North Carolina, and, uh, and a white family um, dealing with children with autism in West Virginia. And the documentary seeks to sort of introduce these people to uh, all of us, to say, here are folks that you might otherwise stereotype. And just like you and me, they have their daily struggles, they have their uh, challenges, but they also approach those challenges with great dignity, great dignity, that I think is a common American trait. So Grit and Grace was really an attempt to try to address some of the hideous ways in which we have thought of ourselves as Americans, uh, thought about other Americans, because I really do think that that understanding is what ultimately allows us to do the hard policy work to say, you know what, we ought to be helping out children in Appalachia or in Youngstown, Ohio, or in Bridgeport, Connecticut. We ought to not turn everything into a battle royale, um, but we ought to sort of see the commonality that we have and invest in each other. I think that's how we both become a better country and how we ultimately deal with some of the brutal economic disparity in this country. And, you know, from that experience, especially, especially I think it's, it hits different when people hear the personal stories, when they hear themselves in, in, in what you're talking about just now. You know, uh, people ultimately are not just policy. They are just human beings. You know, are you hearing any response to that from both your, your colleagues as well as, you know, the people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, again, it comes back to, what I just said, which is that you can hate a stereotype. You can hate a coastal elite. You can hate a Hollywood, you know, brie munching progressive. Um, but when you actually meet that person or when you meet that individual from West Virginia or from wherever, Arizona, who voted for Donald Trump twice and you understand where that comes from, it's hard to hate that individual. That's a profoundly optimistic statement about the human soul, right? It's really hard for us to hate individuals. And that's why demagogues like Donald Trump um, need you to not think about the individuals behind the hideous stereotypes they are, they are painting for you. And so again, um, 
I always close my town hall meetings by saying, look, you can point to any number of things that will make for a healthier politics, ranked choice voting, thinking about primaries that tend to empower the most extremes. But at the end of the day, what we really need to think about is the fact that the liberties and freedoms and privileges that come with being an American citizen also come with obligations. And you know what? Most people can't name an obligation they think that citizenship has. And I would humbly offer that one of those obligations is to not be manipulated by demagogues, to actually understand that problems are complicated, they're shades of gray, that we're talking about people, not stereotypes, that if you're turning on your social media and your blood is boiling, you're you're not being a good American citizen. You're being manipulated. So anyway, as you can tell, I, it's not hard for me to sermonize on this, but I, I really believe that if we don't start taking our obligations as citizens to be critical thinkers of some empathy together, we'll see another January 6th. And uh, speaking of, of, of a long, a long conversation. Um, we only have a couple minutes left here, Congressman. I do want to end um, our chat with asking, you know, before we went on air, we've talked about Memorial Day and you spent time speaking with veterans. We'd love to hear about, you know, what did you hear from them? What are their needs and what do you hope to continue to do for them? Gosh, there's so much there um, <laughs> for, <I know. laughs> for, our last, for our last question. Um, look, there's some very obvious answers, which is that a society in which, um, you know, an awful lot of our veterans are dying by their own hand is not a society we should be comfortable with. So we have an awful lot to do. And one of the things I was very proud of in the last Congress was the bipartisan passage of what was known as the PACT Act, which was really good health care for our veterans that were exposed to burn pits and other other of the tribulations associated with war. Um, but I'll tell you something that sticks with me, because I, I, over the last th three days, I've talked to an awful lot of veterans, many of whom lost friends um, in places like Vietnam and Korea and, 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 and in the Middle East. And um, interestingly enough, you know, though they may be wearing their uniforms, talk to a veteran about what war is really like. Um, and though it may not come through immediately, veterans will make a case for avoiding war. Uh, for not going there. We tend to glorify it, right? Our movies glorify war and it's, you know, honor and duty and country and, you know, you get medals and stuff. Uh, talk to a veteran about what it's like to see his or her friend killed um, after they had a meal together. Um, and what you will do is you will reestablish the sense of how very, very carefully, carefully we should approach uh, conflicts abroad. Um, and this, of course, comes on the heels of Afghanistan and Iraq, where we lost immense amounts of, uh, of, 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 of treasure and, and blood. Um, and so anyway, I always sort of come away humbled from my conversations with veterans in terms of how they think about uh, conflict and war and how very careful we should be about getting into those conflicts. Well, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. And I just want to take a moment to thank you, Congressman Himes, for spending time with us today. Thanks very much, Catherine. After the break, Connecticut Mirror's federal policy reporter Lisa Hagan will be joining us with her reactions. And you can also join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. We just heard from Congressman Jim Himes on his thoughts about international, national, and local issues. And for some perspective on what he had to say, joining me now is Lisa Hagan. She's the federal policy reporter at the Connecticut Mirror. Thanks so much for joining us today, Lisa. Hey, it's great to be back. And so you've been listening to the conversation with Congressman Himes. Now, are there things that jumped out to you? What did you take away from it? Yeah, I think the biggest thing was him talking about this debt limit deal that will get voted on some point this week and him basically saying that he would get behind it, though he's not happy about it. And I'm sure most Democrats aren't thrilled with it, as well as there's some Republicans who aren't happy with it as well. And so I think uh, the White House and some uh, Democratic leadership would be pretty thrilled to hear him say that he he would vote for that package and that's one less vote they have to get. And so there will have to probably be a decent amount more Democratic members like Congressman Himes who are going to get behind it because there's just some Republicans who are, this is, this deal is a non-starter. 
And this is something that, of course, we've been hearing about over the weekend and, and this morning. You know, that's really all I've been I've been listening to on the radio. So, with what Congressman Heim said, is that typical? Is that something that you've also been hearing from from uh, his colleagues um, at the Capitol? Yeah, uh, just it, yeah. In terms of this debt limit deal, I mean, is this something that needs to to get done? He, I think, alluded to the fact that you know this is basically a game of political chicken that happens sometimes. This is probably uh, the most challenging one that Congress has had to deal with in some time. It is it, this is but basically Congress always passes, uh, basically expanding or raising the debt ceiling and being able to pay its bills. And so uh, this is something that's pretty much consuming all of Washington Congress for the next week. I think we now have until June 5th until something absolutely needs to be done. And so it's now just a matter of vote counting and making sure that enough people get behind it to pass it and so that the president can sign it into law. Well, and speaking of consuming, just want to ask real quickly too, you know, can you tell us what happened over the weekend in regards to this bill? Yeah, so basically they had over the weekend had a deal in principle and then now the legislative text is out in, t- in terms of uh, basically a compromise on agreeing to raise the debt ceiling. I think it is through early 2025 so that'll get congress through the next election which is always a it always makes passing legislation a bit trickier and yeah and congressman himes alluded to some of the things that are in the package one of the biggest i think sticking points for democrats and, and many in the delegation for for connecticut was stricter work requirements to access food stamps or snap benefits and so it wasn't as as uh, tough as they, they they thought it might be, they originally wanted to raise the age for work requirements to 56, and now it seems like this deal is to 54. So it's not as uh, stringent of work requirements. Um, it seems like they didn't impose any work requirements around Medicaid, and that was something that President Biden stuck to. And then, yeah, same as Congressman Himes mentioned, is that the president wouldn't be able to keep ex- uh, extending the pause on student loan repayments. And so that's just some of the the bigger things. But yeah, I mean, Republicans did get a decent amount of what they wanted out of this compromise. He is right. Uh, Congressman Himes is right in the sense that Democrats didn't get much from this. But at the same time, the the spending cuts weren't as deep as I think some Republicans were pushing for. And we know that tomorrow they're, they're, the vote is expected. And But do you think we'll continue to see this debate? Um, is this an ongoing debate despite tomorrow um, going into a vote? Yeah, it is, because I think Congressman Himes is thinking of his one piece of this. It's that the House would vote on this, but then it's still got to pass the Senate. And so uh, there might be a procedural vote in the House tonight, and then it would potentially could pass the House on Wednesday. But then the moving part is the Senate and getting it through that. I mean, Democrats control that chamber. It's very narrow. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of sticking points for for a lot of different members. And then, yeah, and then from there, you got to get to the president's desk. So I, I think we're going to see this play out uh, pretty close up until up until the deadline of early next week. When in spree, uh, speaking of presidents, you know, do you agree with Congressman Himes's uh, position on what to expect for the 2024 presidential race? Oh, it's so hard to say. I mean, it's the 2024 GOP primary is really feeling like it's shaping up what the 2020 Democratic primary really looked like. We just in 2020, man, there was like 20 different Democrats running to try to get the nomination. And we're not quite there yet in terms of 20 candidates for the Republican field. But there are so many Republicans jumping in some some names I don't think more people are familiar with in terms of that they're not in they're not in Congress or the political space. You have Senator Tim Scott, you have former Governor Nikki Haley, you have Governor Ron DeSantis from Florida. I mean, the field just keeps growing by day. And so uh, it, it seems like former President Donald Trump is still the front runner in terms of he obviously has, you know, huge name recognition. He was the former president. He is he's been through this, you know, battle with Biden before. Um, but you know, there's so many political lifetimes between now and the primaries of 2024. So it is hard to say what kind of rematch we're seeing, other than the fact that it seems like Democrats are falling completely in line, at least mostly with President Biden running again. 
Right. Well, and like I said earlier, it seems like a long ways to go, but it's really just around the corner in terms of the political <laughs> timelines. I appreciate you mentioning that. And and also, you know, Congressman Himes was named the top Democrat on the Intelligence Committee this year. Can you talk about how significant is that? And what are your thoughts about what he what he said about Ukraine and China? Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. It's a committee that got a lot of attention over the last few years, probably more than ever, because the House Intelligence Committee was at the center of the first impeachment hearings against former President Donald Trump. And so it's he, he's right in the sense that, you know, when he said that he went with the Republican chairman to Ukraine to display bipartisan support, you know, for Ukraine fighting for its independence. Uh, I think that's the goal of the House Intelligence Committee going forward is kind of bringing it back to its roots of being a fairly bipartisan committee, despite, you know, hyperpartisanship in Congress. And so now that we've seemed to have moved beyond, you know, at least for now, impeachments and, and the House Intelligence Committee being in those circles, I think we're going to see this committee just, you know, be a little more collegial. Uh, obviously, the Chinese spy balloons were a big one for them. They're thinking about um, just a whole host and they're kind of overseeing U.S. intelligence agencies. So Congressman Himes has a big role to play in this space. And he's been he's been on that committee for over a decade. And so uh, I just think the biggest thing with that committee is that you're not going to see that really hyper partisan, you know, tensions in that committee anymore. Well, and then you've been covering the U.S. Capitol for both uh, Connecticut Mirror and CT Public, and we'll love to sort of pick your brain on on your thoughts on what do you think Connecticut representatives need to be focused on in Congress to improve income equality, tax policy, education, housing issues in the state, which are all topics that Congressman Himes have mentioned. Yeah, I mean, he really touched on a lot of it, and I think the biggest biggest issue I, I know for I, people around the country, but especially for Connecticut is housing. And, you know, he mentioned that as a way to, you know, try to bridge the gap with income disparities and, and, and inequities. And it's just something that I'm not sure will get done at the federal level. Um, I, frankly, a lot's not going to get done just because of the environment, the political environment in Congress. And so, um, I know housing is a big one for him. I don't know if there'll be any major action at that level. And that might be something that would be more state level focused action, which I know Connecticut is, is really starting to, you know, zero in on. And so, you know, he, he mentioned childcare as being a part of this, uh, again, something that Congress did try to tackle when they had that big, uh, Democrats big inflation reduction act they had tried to do some pretty significant child care funding in there and it got stripped out towards the end as they needed to you know build more support and you know obviously not everything was going to be make it to the final stages and so um a lot of these things he mentioned that i think would address income inequality just don't seem like they're going to happen at the federal level and so we will we'll have yet to see but um it might be something that Connecticut is going to have to do on its own in Hartford. Lisa Hagan, she's a federal policy reporter at the Connecticut Mirror. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Great to be here. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible and Anya Grandalski. Our technical producer is Jean Amatruda. Download where we live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs>